This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 29th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss how the FY24 supplemental and FY25 budgets are shaping up. Second, we explain the latest embarrassment involving the Permanent Fund Board and ask whether it will ever stop. And third, we discuss what we believe is the worst idea yet for dealing with the so-called Cook Inlet gas crisis. One final note, due to some technical difficulties today, viewers may notice we go old school about a third of the way through today's podcast and shift over to the telephone. All of the content from the show is included, except for the air diagrams Michael and I are sometimes prone to draw with our hands. And now, let's join Michael. We're going to start off with a weekly top three. And the big one at the very top of the board is, what is this uh, year's budget cycle telling us? What, what exactly are we figuring out by watching this year's budget cycle? Well, Michael, uh, there's been a lot, <clears throat> there's been some press about uh, the Senate uh, Finance Committee actions on the budget. Uh, there was an article in, uh, James Brooks had an article in the Alaska Beacon. There was an article in the ADN um, that was headlined, Alaska Senate Budget Crafters Reduced Dividend Size in Effort to Avoid Draw from uh, Savings. Uh, last week, um, we at the end of last week's show, you and I discussed what I was looking forward to during the week. Uh, one of them was a, was a, a presentation by Alexi Painter of the Legislative Finance Division on where the budgets uh, are, uh, and he did that on Thursday. And it's very telling uh, for those who haven't uh, gone back to look at it. You can find the presentation, the slide deck from the presentation um, in Thursday, uh, last Thursday's uh, Senate Finance Committee uh, on uh, on the legislative web website. Um, and it's very telling. Uh the, there were there are two things that the Senate is dealing with in this budget. One is the FY24 supplemental budget, and the other is the FY25 uh, budget. Uh, both the both the supplemental budget, the FY24, is dealing with operating and capital supplementals. The FY25 budget is dealing. Uh, the Senate dealt with last week the operating piece of it. It already dealt with the capital piece of it. The operating budget, uh, the FY24 budget is, to me, is very telling. It, it shows there's one slide that Alexi has that, uh, that totals up the revenue uh, for, the, uh, for the year, uh, according to the uh, Department of Revenue spring forecast, totals up the spending prior to the supplemental, and then uh, looks at, the, at what the supplemental is doing. And, and it shows revenues of $6.5 billion, including, uh, including they include the full uh, POMV draw as part of revenue. So that's an inflated number compared to what we usually talk about, but 6.5, 6.6 billion dollars in revenue. Spending before the supplemental was 6.0 uh, billion dollars. That was spending from last year's uh, legislative session for the FY24 budget, leaving a remaining surplus. They called it a surplus, even though that surplus was built on the backs of PFD cuts. Uh, made last year. That remaining surplus uh, was $578 million. That's a lot of money, half a billion dollars in surplus 
in FY24 going into uh, the supplemental budget. Uh, they spent uh, $320 million of that on additional operating supplementals, $127 million in addition, additional operating supplementals, another $190 million. These, this is UGF money we're talking about, unrestricted general fund money, another $190 million um, in, uh, in UGF supplemental or capital supplementals. That makes a total capital spend, UGF capital spend, for FY24 when you add that and what was in the original budget together of, uh, of nearly uh, $560 million. Huge capital budget compared to what we've been running in the past. Uh, so those supplementals took away another $320 million. Of the, of the $578 million, $575 million in surplus, they gave another 143 uh, in supplemental uh, 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 PFDs, what they're, what they're calling the energy relief that will be delivered uh, next fall as part of the regular uh, PFD. That 143 uh, million sort of calculates out to around 200, a little bit over $200 uh, per PFD. Very interesting thing that they did with that. Uh, what the original budget did was say any surplus over a certain amount would be split 50% between the PFD and 50% uh, between the capital budget up to a up to a certain threshold, the the spring revenue forecast shows a portion of that of that additional amount going that is being is being generated by the revenues coming from the F, from the from the spring revenue forecast from the oil prices and the spring revenue forecast. A portion of that is uh, is is generated to the PFD. What the what the Senate did was go back in and cap that. At the at the revenue level, uh, the cap that supplemental uh, PFD at the revenue level uh, that was projected by the spring revenue forecast. Oil prices have continued to climb since the spring revenue forecast. The revenues anticipated to be realized in FY24 are now higher than they were in the spring revenue forecast. But the Senate went in and nevertheless capped the PFD. So the, so that PFD, that supplemental PFD that they touted last year as being 50% of whatever was over a certain amount, up to a certain amount, uh, is now capped at, at, uh, at, at roughly $200. Uh, and the rest of it is being spent or being, uh, or being directed to, uh, to the, the CBR. So the, 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 the takeaway from the FY24 supplemental budget is they've got a lot more uh, they, they got a lot more revenue than they anticipated, a half a billion dollars in additional revenue than they anticipated. But they spent most of it um, and, and spent a, a, a capped portion of it, directed a capped portion of it, less than what the less than what the original bill called for, a capped portion of it to uh, to Alaskans in the form of a PFD. The FY25 budget uh, tells us much so the same thing. So what you're saying is they perform what? Michael, what you're saying up. is that you, they performed a little voodoo here. Uh, yeah, they're performing. They're performing a little voodoo there by basically saying, "Oh, we said we're going to give you the 50 percent of it beyond this," and then they go ahead and they change the rules and they use the old spending projections instead of the newest and latest and greatest spending projections that actually show they're making even more, so that they can take the lion's share of it uh, all over. I mean, it's 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 again it's that shell game it's that voodoo economics uh, and numbers game that uh, Bert Stedman and company are yeah what they're telling you what they're telling you is even when the senate finance tells you in the budget uh what the pfd is going to be you can't trust even that i mean you can't trust the statute because oh that's too old uh, and and now you can't even trust what they tell you in any given budget cycle uh, what the PFD is going to be now that we're setting the PFD by by budget cycle by appropriations bill, you can't even trust what what the appropriations bill tells you it's going to be because we're going to come back in in the supplemental and we're going to change the rules on the game uh, with respect to that. It's not a huge difference. Uh, it's maybe seventy five dollars a PFD between what the revenues look like they're going to be for FY twenty four and what they've capped the level they've capped the PFD at. Uh, but it's just, I mean. In terms of trust, uh, it's just it just they just keep breaking that trust. You know, not only breaking it, they just stomp on it 
uh, every every uh, it seems every chance uh, every chance they get. And in terms of you know the 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 the, the refrain that we're gonna we're gonna cap spending, trust us, the Senate, we're gonna keep spending uh, under control. <laughs> when they got extra money, they spend it. Uh, and they spend it uh, uh, by almost doubling the capital budget and by increasing the operating budget. FY25 sort of tells the same story. Uh, they use the spring revenue forecast uh, and they spend uh, they spend a bunch of it the, the, on, on the regular on the regular um, uh, uh, budget, uh, the FY25 projected budget, uh, they cut the PFD in order to have, you know, revenue there to, to fund additional budget. Then they've got outstanding items, the fiscal notes that are coming through, the, the broadband bill the governor signed adds on to that, the senior benefits bill that has passed the Senate and some expect to pass the House adds on to that. Other bills uh, that have passed one body but not yet the other adds on to that. Salary adjustments, they've got two negotiations coming up. Uh, union negotiations coming up, well, more than two coming up, uh, and they expect additional uh, uh, additional dollars from that. Uh, and then they got to House additions, the additions to the capital budget. By the time they finish with the FY25 budget, even after cutting the PFD down to uh, 2575, POMB 2575, they still have a deficit. Uh, they have a they have a slight surplus, a two hundred million dollars surplus off the regular budget. But when you add in those additional items, uh, it produces a deficit. And then, on top of that, at the Senate Finance Committee, where they've just gone over all these all these numbers, they have committee amendments that add on top of that even more. Um, the landmine had a list of those, or had a had a somewhat partial list of those uh, in in the Sunday column. Kelly Merrick adds, uh, Senator Kelly, Kelly Merrick moved an amendment uh, that added $4 million to the Anchorage Homeless Center. They added $10 million to the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute and moved that into the base budget as opposed to, as opposed to one-time money. Uh, $12.5 million in UGF distributions to school districts. They were They're adding all that additional money uh, uh, into the budget, even after they've just been told that there is a uh, there's a deficit, given what they've already done uh, with the budget, the operating budget, and the additional amounts that are coming in as a result of the legislature. So they also set up a waterfall for FY25, the same way as FY24, where revenues above a certain amount are supposed to be split 50-50 between the PFD and the and the and and, and the CBR. All right. Uh, well, we're attempting to uh, bring everything back together here. Uh, I brought Brad on um, for uh, I brought Brad on the telephones now to see if we can make this uh, see if we can make this just a little bit better. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, our guest. Let's uh, let's continue on here and uh, and get things uh, get things going. Brad, you were finishing up with number one before I so rudely interrupted you with the uh, with the. Uh, <laughs> with the end of the show, like right at the break. So let's uh, let's finish up with number one. You were giving us your final thoughts on that here as we continue ahead. Well, the final thoughts, Michael, I was I was talking about FY25, the FY25 budget. And and essentially what I was saying was the, the, the Senate did the same thing with respect to FY25. They did the 24. They loaded up a bunch of money, loaded up a bunch of additional spending. Uh, into uh, the FY25 budget, even after they were told by uh, by legislative finance that they that they were now they loaded it up so much that they were running a deficit against FY25 uh, revenues. Uh, even their calculation of FY25 revenues, which was based on a 2575 POMV, uh, they added some additional amendments additional amendments to the budget that uh, that put it even further into uh, into debt. Bert has said. Senator Stedman has said he expects all that to be reconciled in the conference committee and they won't come out with a, a final budget that's in deficit, but they, they've spent it all uh, up to up to POMB 2575. The, and the, the, and, and the, that's even the after one, and even that's even after, again, rejiggering the whole, uh, you know, oh, the 50 50 split after the thing. And did, I mean, they, they, they've taken it all in more. Right, right. And 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 the funny, the really humorous thing, sort of, 
uh, about it all is in the FY25 budget, they redo the waterfall that they had in the FY24 budget, which is here's here's the budget. And then above that budget amount, if we get revenues above that budget amount, we'll split it between the PFD, a supplemental PFD, and uh, and the CDR. But the problem is, uh, you know, they they did that in FY24, and now in the FY24, they they pulled the pulled the rug out from underneath it and said, well, we're just going to cap, you know, sort of regardless of what the revenues are, we're going to go ahead and cap what the PFD amount is. But why do you believe that? Why do you believe in FY25 they're going to do anything differently, um, even though they put it in the FY25 budget? So it's it's um, it doesn't give one a whole lot of faith that the Senate is either able to live up to the Senate Finance Committee is able to live up either to the commitments it make, makes in the prior uh, appropriations bill about what they're going to do with the PFD and that the Senate Finance Committee is able to constrain spending. They just keep going and keep going and keep going. Uh, until they've spent it all. Which is what our prediction has been uh, the entire time. Um, that's, the, you know, the, is that they will spend every dollar that they can until they run out of money and then they'll come back hat in hand or maybe not hat in hand. They'll just come back and say, it's time for you guys to pay your fair share. That's what they're going to do. Um, and that's yeah. that's the pain right there. Well, it, it, but it, but it's but the pain's already here, Michael. I mean, they'll come back at that time and say, "Yes, now we need taxes, so you pay your fair share." But they will have taken all the PFD uh, or a substantial portion of the PFD, so middle and lower income Alaska families will have already been taxed uh, uh, disproportionately uh, uh, through PFD cuts, and then they'll layer on a tax uh, on top of that, uh, which, if it's a sales tax, is another regressive tax. So it's. They're, 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 they are repeatedly, repeatedly screwing over middle and lower income Alaska families uh, by the fiscal, uh, uh, the fiscal policy that they're adopting as they go through here. All right, Brad, let's move on to number two. Jeff Landfield broke a story in uh, on Friday uh, in the Alaska landmine that has now been picked up by a number of other publications, and I expect will continue to grow in the days ahead. Jeff got his hands on uh, some internal uh, permanent fund corporation emails relating uh, mostly to the activities of, uh, of of one of the trustees, Ellie Rubenstein, David Rubenstein's daughter, uh, uh, and uh, and and her activities with respect to how she's dealing with a bunch of private equity firms. The, the complaint throughout the throughout the, the the story and throughout the emails that Jeff got his hand on hands on and these complaints are not Jeff's these complaints he's merely reporting on internal complaints inside the permanent fund corporation that people inside the permanent fund corporation are raising about about uh, Grubenstein's activities uh, these complaints are essentially that she's using her position as a trustee, uh, on the permanent fund board to arrange meetings and to try to tilt investment strategies in a way that benefits funds, uh, uh, private equity funds that are also invested in her private equity fund. Oh. Um, and and trying to tilt uh, through meetings and through recommendations and through various other things. And in some instances, complaints about uh, permanent fund staff suggesting that permanent fund staff aren't up to the certain permanent fund staff aren't up to the job or suggesting in one case that permanent fund staff be fired uh, uh, trying to tilt uh, not only through meetings but also through these internal recommendations about staffing trying to tilt the the, the permanent fund investments toward her favored uh, 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 private equity funds private credit funds and her favorite private equity and private credit funds happen to be ones that invest in her, uh, in her uh, private equity funds. So it's right. it's a it's a fairly shady uh, set of dealings that uh, that are uncovered by uh, uncovered by uh, this uh, these string of emails. It's it's well worth reading, not only Jeff's original column, as I say, in the Friday Alaska Landmine, but also the sort of the follow up that Dermot Cole and, and others are doing. Uh, around that, there's there's two other things that also show up in this string of emails that I just find fascinating. One is 
that she says in 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 one of these in one of these conversations that are that are picked up in the emails she says that the governor is not going to re, is not going to reappoint Ethan Shutt who's the current chairman of the permanent fund board is not going to reappoint him to his to his position and you know that's not public information it's certainly not not information that that would be known uh, uh, widely outside of the governor's office and those that relate to them, uh, and so she's she's passing on this information to private equity funds about the chairman of the of, of the permanent fund board, and and the other thing the emails show that I find fascinating is she's end running the chain of command. She's having she's having exchanges with not only not only the leaders of various permanent fund corporation divisions. Without without including the CEO of the Permanent Fund Corporation, she's having discussions with staff of the PE of the of the Permanent Fund Corporation without without notifying uh, their leaders or their their the, the people to whom they report, and she's not including the chairman of the of the Permanent Fund Board on any of this as far as as far as the release email show, which is which is another. I mean, you, she's not she's not the chairman of the Permanent Fund Board. She's a member of the Permanent Fund Board. The board, the board has a chairman, and she ought to be reporting her what she's doing to the chairman of the permanent fund board, which is essentially her boss with respect to permanent fund activities. So it's just a it's just a a, a, a continuous sort of sleaze uh, factor that's uh, that's going on around uh, around Rubenstein. I mean this this comes on top of the past controversies of of her and others' proposals to increase. Uh, borrowing that the permanent fund board would begin the permanent fund corporation would begin borrowing money to invest trying to run its own hedge fund uh that uh, that that they ought to be assuming increased risk uh, uh upping the the risk profile of the permanent fund corporation which you know is is part of their effort part of her effort to get to 100 billion dollars that she was talking about in Saudi Saudi Arabia last year the in-state investment program the permanent fund board did it's it's ending in at least partial disaster. One of the one of the companies they invested in through this in-state investment program, Peter Pan Seafoods, is now shutting down operations uh, in the uh, right. broadly in the state. Right. And the Anchorage office establishing an Anchorage office against the wishes of the legislature. So it's just you know it's just it just it's just another brick in the wall, but a fairly big brick. Right. Another brick in the wall about how far the the permanent fund corporation has gotten out of control. Yeah, no, it seems it seems like she's turning it into her own little fiefdom, where she's making it her own uh, her own personal uh, uh, power bank for wielding uh, wielding this financial and political power uh, to be- basically benefit her own uh, her own funds in the end. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, it shows that I mean, at, at a minimum, she says she didn't she didn't do anything wrong. Um, of course. Uh, that she's merely setting up these meetings with, you know, with, with big players, potential powerful players, players that she thinks ought to be engaged in business with the permanent fund, with the permanent fund corporation. But that's not her role as a permanent fund board trustee. She's a board member. She's not an executive officer of the permanent fund corporation. She could recommend to the board, and the board could adopt a policy, and the policy and the and the permanent fund executive team could be told to go pursue those sorts. of of relationships, if the if the permanent fund board voted for it, he could do that. Uh, but she's she's just you know cutting all sorts of corners here uh, by going directly to permanent fund co- corporation staffers, uh, setting up meetings between staffers and and members of these of these private equity companies. And and it's not her role to be doing that. She wants to go to work for the permanent fund. She wants to give up her private equity role. If she wants to be considered to be a permanent fund corporation officer, then then have at it. Uh, but but don't act as if you're representing the permanent fund corporation. Don't act as if you are a permanent fund corporation executive member uh, uh, when you're out there uh, in the world, particularly when you're doing it with uh, uh, private equity funds that are all are also invested in your uh, in your own, your own business. You uh, you kind of uh, in some of the you're, you're kind of in some of the uh, uh, areas around here and and know maybe some of the players. What is the reaction been so far 
uh, in this? What is, uh, you know, what 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 is the reaction to the story, Ben? It sounds like she has no shame on it, uh, but what, uh, you know, what what's what's the overall feel on it? I think the reaction is is sort of, you know, the people put their 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 face in their hands, just sort of, you know, just sort of cringe at at another LA story. I mean, it's. Um, it, it, she is not acting consistent with what board members are supposed to act like. And, and when you look at these internal emails, there's one exchange between uh, the, the senior vice president for compliance, risk and compliance in the permanent fund corporation, who's supposed to be in charge of this sort of stuff. And it's sort of like, you know, why is she doing this? It's not, it's, this stuff is not consistent with her responsibilities. As a board member, it's not even within the scope of what she possibly could claim is her responsibilities as a board member. So it's just it's just continued cringe um, that is coming from this. I mean, it, it's grounds if 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 a lot of people were governor, it'd be grounds to terminate her to 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 for cause. Uh, this would be a sufficient cause to terminate her from uh, from the permanent fund corporation board. I don't know if the governor I, I doubt the governor will take that action. He seems to be enamored of Ellie. Uh, but uh, but it's it's certainly Really. Well, I mean, he's enamored with her, but he's out there. She's out there basically embarrassing the administration and every, I mean, so why, what's the, you know, what's, what's going on? Why, why would, uh, why would he could just because he thinks she's great? I mean, is there another reason that you could think of that this might be going on? Oh, people will speculate a bunch of, a bunch of additional reasons, including, you know, some financial ties between between the governor and the, and, and Carlisle Group, the Rubenstein, David Rubenstein's uh, effort, or or maybe even Ellie's effort, I don't think that's true. I think I think he just, you know, this state. I, I, I said this in a in a comment last week. This state um, seems to to be enamored of of you know power and influence and and money and. And and they and they let money get away with people with money get away with a lot of things. I mean, the, the using permanent fund cut permanent fund dividend cuts to finance government is one of those things because the top twenty percent don't have to pay for it. The, the burden is shifted to middle and lower income Alaska families. Um, we have all sorts of ties between you know capital pro, capital expenditures and and various uh, various members of various wealthy individuals in the state. We just. We just seem to be enamored of people with money. And so Ellie has a lot of money, has her family has a lot of money, her family's well connected. Uh, David is one of the richest people uh, in the world. Her father is one of the richest people in the world. And so you 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 somehow give an entitlement or somehow give some special credit uh, to those people. But she's abusing it. I mean, she's she's running amok with it. Uh, she's out there, you know, making contacts. She shouldn't, she's out there trying to establish relationships that are way beyond her her responsibility or her or her authority as a board member um, and she's abusing abusing the uh, the trust the governor's put put in her uh Brad uh, I'm I mean I would say I'm shocked by Rubenstein's actions and the lack of action from the governor but at this point isn't it kind of what we've come to expect at this point? I mean, kind of this, just uh, let it lay. And if I don't, you know, get my thing and, and all, I mean, it's just, it's, it's nutty. It's nutty. Yeah. It's a sleaze factor, Michael. I mean, it's a, uh, uh, we, we, the permanent fund board has been sliding down this hill for a while now. I mean, the, 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 the proposals for increased taking increased risk and for borrowing, to, uh, to run its own hedge fund, I think, are just are are, are nutty themselves. The interstate investment program, I think, is has always held the potential to be nutty, turned into have nutty results. It's certainly living up to that, at least in the case of Peter Pan. The Anchorage office never made much sense, other than some people wanted to live in Anchorage, other than Juno. Uh, but you know, <laughs> there's 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 remote work, and there's all sorts of other things that could have enabled. Enabled that, uh, that sort of nutty. I mean, we, we've been sliding down this border, down this, down this hill for a while. And as you know, you and I have talked about on previous shows. I, a long time ago, I said, look, we need to restructure the permanent fund board. We need to, we need to start over again. We need to reset the qualifications. We need to make sure these people aren't political. 
Uh, I mean, Adam Crum and, and Jason Bernie have been have been part of this, part of the proposals to increase risk and increase borrowing. Ellie has been part of that cabal, and now you know she's sort of going off on her next frolic and detour. I we we need to reprofessionalize the board because I mean, <laughs> you. you you want the board to be detached. You want the board to have an overview. You want the board to sort of sit there and be judges in a sense of what management's doing. Management's the one that's running the permanent fund corporation. And, and you want to let them run the permanent fund corporation subject to board overview. Ellie's just, I mean, now the board is just sort of trying to trying to run the place itself, sort of skipping through and you know, picking, picking employees that they want to have interview, talk to. Uh, talk to these the, these private equity firms, suggesting some be fired, suggesting some aren't up to the job. Uh, the the board is, I mean, she's just taking the board to new levels, new lows of, in terms of uh, in terms of its meddling uh, inside the corporation. So I think we just need to start over, frankly, um, just like we did with the Alaska Public Utilities Commission in the late 1990s. It had gotten carried away, it wasn't fulfilling the, the mission that that I think the legislature thought it ought to be uh, pursuing. And so the, the, the legislature just sets, sunset the APUC and created the Regulatory Commission of Alaska, the RCA, what we have now that governs utilities, just started over. And I think the same sort of sequence uh, uh, is, 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 it involves a permanent fund board now. We ought to just sunset the one we've got and start over with much more professional, much, much tighter, much, much, much clearer standards about what the board ought to be engaged in. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, uh, our guest. Um, I mean, it, uh, and I would love to see that as well. I mean, I think we need, I think we need to, to have that. Unfortunately, I just don't see, I just don't see somebody, uh, stepping up and uh, and saying that I don't see somebody saying that that's uh, that this is the answer unfortunately and uh, and and so here we are here we are wondering uh, what's going to happen and how we're going to be embarrassed and and how are the power players the ones that seem to be making all the you know they're making they're they're benefiting from all this stuff you know the the Ellie Rubensteins who's already again one of the richest families in the world. Uh, they're the ones benefiting and we're all just kind of sitting around going, well, how does that, how does that work for us? How does that, you know, it, it's, it's frustrating from my point of view, for sure. It, it's going it, to, there's going to be an interesting, I mean, dynamic when the governor comes up on the, on Ethan shut the end of Ethan shuts terms. If, if firm, if Ethan wants to be reappointed, current, current chairman of the board, if Ethan wants to be reappointed. Ellie's gone out there now and said, well, Ethan's not the governor's not going to reappoint, which implies that she's had conversations with the governor's office, at least the governor's office, if not the governor, about about Ethan. Ethan's been sort of a counterbalance to this cabal of of Crum and and Bernie and 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 Rubenstein. If the governor doesn't reappoint him, uh, I think that sends a signal that the governor's just, you know, going right along with the sleeves that sort of infected the board. I would hope the governor, if Ethan wants to be reappointed, given Ethan's role in being a counterbalance to this cabal, I think I think it'd be great if the governor did re- reappoint Ethan we- and sort of send a signal that way. Yep. Okay, continuing up now, finishing with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. One of our reoccurring themes here on the program over the last few weeks has been the issue with Cook Inlet, the Cook Inlet gas issue and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Brad is he's dived deep on this. He's done some debates with John Sims. He's we've talked about done all kinds of stuff. Uh, but now he's got an example of probably the worst thing you could do uh, for the Cook Inlet gas issue. Brad, what what's taken place here in the last week that uh, caused you to to jump to this conclusion? You know, Michael, you know, when we talked about the Cook Inlet, you kept raising uh, uh, the fact that you we're creating a crisis around the Cook Inlet, who there, re- who there really isn't, but we're creating a crisis around the Cook Inlet, and people are trying to take advantage uh, of that crisis in various ways. I, we just had what I think is the best, the, the best example or the worst example of somebody trying to use the, quote, crisis, quotes, air quotes, crisis uh, for their own advantage. In an op-ed in the ADN and elsewhere, former Governor Frank Murkowski 
um, uh, in the in the ADM, the title is: Are we really running out? Are we really running out of gas in Cook Inlet? But that's not what the that's not the what not what the article with his with his op ed really focuses on. What Murkowski suggests is the way to really solve Cook Inlet is to build is to extend the Alaska Railroad from Fairbanks up to the North Slope, and then rail line down LNG liquefied natural gas, liquefy natural gas on the slope, and then railroad it down to Fairbanks, and then presumably railroad it on down to Anchorage, and use that as a way of, of, of solving the, bringing in this, this, this North Slope gas via LNG, via railroad, uh, using that to, uh, to solve the, uh, the Cook Inlet gas crisis. It, it, it's a perfect example of somebody saying, oh, there's a crisis? Wait, I've got something, I've got this project I wanted to do for you know, 50 years, and let's see how I can manipulate that to fit that into the crisis to make it to make it a solution to the crisis. Frank's long wanted to extend the railroad all sorts of various places, uh, but now he's proposing to do it uh, up to the North Slope as part of the solution uh, to this problem. I mean, uh, last time this, I last time I heard it was something like two million dollars a rail mile to lay new rail, and that's like a regular. That's not barring any kind of major, uh, you know, uh, uh, environmental issues or anything else. I mean, who's going to pay for? I mean, who pays? Right? That's the big question. Who pays? It's always the question. Frank Frank says he estimates the number of ten billion dollars. Uh, in the, in this article, he says, but you know that's ten billion dollars we otherwise would spend on the on the bullet line that would come down to carry natural gas down to South Central, and and look at all these additional things we get out of this rail line. I mean, it, his 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 ultimate goal, as you read through this article, the ultimate goal is when the oil finally drops below three hundred million a day, then it's not going to be you're not going to be able to pipeline it because of all sorts of mechanical issues. Which is true. There, there's been long, long warnings about that. But Frank said, "Look, we'll have a rail line then, and we can bring the oil down, the oil below 300 million a day, 300,000 a day. Excuse me. Uh, bring the oil down, uh, uh, down the uh, down the rail line because we'll have a rail line up there, and then we can convert the oil line to a gas line, which has huge costs and huge implications. We can convert the oil line to a gas line, and then you, and then bring the rest of the gas down through the." Through the old oil line, it's. I mean, it, it's it's. Frank's long held this desire to extend, as I said, the Alaska Railroad, not only to the slope but also to the Yukon and and all sorts of other places, and and he's trying to fit that that square peg into the round hole of uh, of what what's going on in the Cook Inlet. It just it just typifies. It struck me as I read this. It just typifies. What you've talked about in previous shows, and, and and we've talked about together in some of the previous shows, which is just, you know, we got a crisis. People say we got this crisis in the in the Cook Inlet, uh, and we've got to and we've got to come up with some super plan to meet the crisis. Back to basics: there is no crisis. We don't have we don't have a shortfall in gas for South Central. We've got a world market out there in the form of liquefied natural gas on the on the world stage that's in glut. Uh, that we can bring a portion of it, small portion of it, into the Cook Inlet. There's there's ample supply out there in the world to meet the Cook Inlet Cook Inlet needs. Uh, and and if you say, well, it's going to be more expensive. Well, Cook Inlet supplies, according to the analyses that have been done by the utilities themselves and by DNR, Cook Inlet supplies are going to be even more expensive than bringing in LNG. It's not, you know, it's not. Yes, there is. There may be gas in Cook Inlet, but it costs huge amounts to go get that additional supply of gas. And LNG is a cheaper, cheaper solution to that. So not only does it bring supply on a certain basis, uh, but it brings in supply at a lower cost than the, al- the alternative of, of spending additional amounts to get it out of uh, to get it out of Cook Inlet. So there really isn't a crisis in the first place. Uh, people are trying to make it into a crisis to pursue their own particular agendas. You've talked in, on previous shows about about it's being used for protectionism. Right. That oh, even though Cook Inlet is more, even though Cook Inlet supplies are more expensive, we need to protect them because it's an Alaska source of supply. So, so we need to come up with all these subsidies in order to subsidize uh, uh, Alaska production that would be subsidized on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families through increased PFD cuts. 
we need to come up with all of these subsidy programs in order to protect the cook inlet, the cook inlet uh, industry. And now Frank's come up with we need you know we need to build rail in order to uh, in order to meet this crisis. Isn't the crisis? We've got a solution. The industry's identified a solution. We need to get on with that solution. It's the it's it's not cheap, but it's the lowest cost among the alternatives according to last year's study by by the consultants and by the utilities themselves. It is the most secure supply because because we're not depending upon whether fields actually get developed. We we know the supply is out there on the world market, um, and we just need to get on with that and and stop this, these these games that people are coming up with about oh no we need to subsidize you know something or we need to build a rail line or we need to do you know something extravagant to solve to solve this crisis isn't a crisis we don't need to be doing those things this reminds me you know kind of a we see this in various uh issues of this kind of emotional attachment where it's got to come from here right the gas it should be alaska gas it should be uh, you know, it's like everything we can do to make sure that it's Alaska gas, regardless of who of what the cost is. Regardless, this is the same argument about closing the local schools, right? Well, we don't have the student, we don't have the student population. Well, but this is our local school. We're emotionally attached to it. We, you know, this is the school that my other kids went to or that I went to, and so it's got to stay no matter what. And they they make all these emotionally driven arguments about something that is just not economically feasible, and that happens in a lot of areas, but this is just, to me, just another example. If it's cheaper to bring the LNG in, why wouldn't we want it, it from market forces, from a free market perspective, why wouldn't we want that in the short term, even if we're still developing other sources locally in the long term, why wouldn't we Why wouldn't we want that? Why would we all of a sudden throw everything to the wind just to make sure that the gas or the oil is Alaskan oil? I mean, I suppose we could use John Sims' argument about national security and other things and sustainability and local resources. And, and while I agree with that, the problem is if people can't afford it and it's billions and billions of dollars to do something different, why do we keep fighting it? Oh, it's, uh, I mean, it's the same reason that we tried to grow barley up in the Delta. It's the same reason we built grain terminals in Valdez. It's the same reason we built the, the fish processing plant in Anchorage that, uh, that that's now a church. I mean, it's, we, 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 we think we want to do these things in Alaska, sort of regardless of the cost, uh, and we and we want them to be uh, Alaskanized. We think you know we're, that that they'll be better somehow if we do them in Alaska, or they'll be they'll be you know more secure if we do them in Alaska. But Alaska, what that what 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 that ignores continually ignores is Alaska is a high cost state. It, we have to ship most of our most of our inputs up here. We have to, we have to, you know, we have a, a huge expanse that we try to distribute them into. It's just a, a hugely high cost state. Anything we can do to reduce the cost to Alaskans of of their of of, of our goods, of our basic goods, is an improvement in the state. It makes Alaska more affordable to live in. It makes Alaska easier to live in. It attracts outsiders. I mean, we say we want to bring in. Uh, 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 outsiders to move here. It attracts outsiders if we're if we're a lower cost state. We 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 tend to go. We tend to these things. These things work work across purposes. We say yes, we want it all done in Alaska, but it's more expensive to do it in Alaska. It results in a higher cost of living in Alaska. It results in 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 a higher cost of goods uh, in Alaska when we try to do them internally. What we need to focus on is making Alaska as reasonably priced. Uh, as we can. And in this particular instance, it means not spending on a bunch of subsidies to protect an industry that's in decline, the cooking the production industry that's in decline. It means not to spend a bunch of money on subsidies to build a line down from the North Slope just to just to serve South Central or to build a rail line up to the North Slope in order to in order to bring rail cars down to down to South Central. It means right. using common sense to go pursue the lowest cost uh, alternative to to keep Alaska keep Alaska supplied, and and you know, people create all these nationalism arguments or these national defense arguments or whatever, but they all result in higher costs, and and if you're going to have higher costs, you're going to have people saying, well, then we ought to subsidize the higher costs, and then the subsidies are done on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families through additional PFP cuts, and we just and we just keep this cycle going. Right. Uh, we make Alaska higher. We make we make Alaska higher cost. 
We have to subsidize it. We take more money out of the Alaska, out of Alaska families through additional PFP cuts, and we end up we end up with the worst economic situation in the state. I mean, the the bottom line is is that, uh, and I think the long and the short of it is, we're going to spin our wheels. We're going to spend a lot of times talking about all these different options, all these Alaskan options that will cost billions of dollars, and in the end, we'll probably end up importing the LNG anyway just because it's the really only viable alternative uh, in the short, medium, and maybe even in the long term. That's what we're going to end up doing. But we'll spend a lot of, we'll spend a lot of political capital talking about our pet projects, you know, like you said, forcing these things to fit our ideals of the project that we want to get done. But in the long run, we're going to, you know, and we could get ahead of it right now. We could get ahead of it by talking about and working on the LNG now, but we're going to talk about all this other stuff for the next two years. And then it'll be a last minute crisis to actually get the LNG set up. What do you think? Oh yeah, uh, it, I mean we're already there. We're already we're already heading in that direction. We spent this entire legislative session, people talking about various fixes. You know, royalty relief, which is a subsidy uh, to cook inlet producers. Um, you know, we have a bill in there where Ada, well, the the Alaska Energy Authority uh, would have the ability to to loan make reserve loans, loans against gas reserves in the cook inland to provide financing to cook inland producers at below market rates, not even below market rates, but below AEA's own cost of borrowing, uh, the cost of loans to, to AEA, the legislation that would give an AEA authority to do that provides explicitly that, that, that AEA could make these loans at below its cost of borrowing or its own cost of funds. So it's, which is another subsidy. So. We, we've spent a lot of time this session worried about, you know, how do we, how do we subsidize? You know, how many different ways can we come up with, with subsidies? And Frank's got the late, Mikowski's got the latest with this railroad idea. Oh, we can subsidize it through, through railroad extension. Instead of saying, I mean, NSTAR has consistently said, look, we've got problems with the permitting of the LNG project. We, can, we know the LNG project's doable. But permitting, but permitting is going to extend it out for a couple of years. Instead of focusing on what's the permitting problems, can we solve those permitting problems? Can the legislature help address those permitting problems, even if they're federal problems or the things the leg, or there are things the legislature can urge the congressional delegation to do to solve those problems? There's been no discussion of that. It's all been how can I come up with a subsidy? How can I how how can I come up with money that I can funnel into my pet project? Uh, uh, under the under the rubric of this crisis, meeting this crisis, uh, to make the situation better. It's uh, it's definitely frustrating. Okay, Brad, what are we watching for? Again, we're down to the last what two and a half, two weeks now, just over two weeks. What what are we watching for uh, in the legislature as they go through? I see that they're doing the whole educational bill of rights and all this kind of stuff. What what uh, what what are your thoughts here? Well, from a fiscal perspective. Uh, the Senate uh, uh, this week, at some point this week, uh, will finish out its, its, its votes on the operating budget, will adopt the operating budget. Uh, it'll go back over to the House for concurrence. The House won't concur because of differences in the term of fund dividend. It'll go to conference committee. Um, and the real focus, I think, is going to be on the, from a fiscal standpoint, is going to be on the conference committee. How, in, instead, of, instead of the Anchorage, the ADN headline of, of uh, you know how deep will the PFD cuts be? The real question is how big is the PF tax, PFD tax going to be uh, on uh, how deep the PFD cuts the PFD tax going to be in order to uh, in order to balance the budget. The hope is uh, that, that the Senate floor doesn't add on even more to the FY24 and the F, uh, or the FY25 budget that puts it even deeper in deficit and, make, and makes the PFD cuts even even deeper. The hope is that. That we've hit the high watermark of spending, proposed spending, and now we see the conference committee sort of recede from that high watermark a little bit, and at least hold to hold to the 25, 75 PFD, and, and hold to the proposed waterfall next year. Uh, in uh, uh, in if, if there's surplus revenues, hold to uh, distributing a portion of those in terms of a supplemental PFD. But but that's what's that's what's coming up this year. Yep. Yeah, all right. The Senate action and then the conference committee. We'll be watching this uh, all this week. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thanks for sticking with me, my friend. I appreciate it.
Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Appreciate you coming on board and joining us today. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.